Transmitting at a continuous dimensional rate of 13 realities per minute. This is the wavelength you're looking for. The Subverse City Transmit. Penny for your thoughts, Subver Citizens. Are you all on the edge of your seats because I left you hanging off a cliff? Or are you just chomping at the bit to hear the second part of Zombie Schlager? I'm going to cut to the chase and briefly recap part one for you. We know there was a zombie uprising where the nation just seemed to go to hell in a handbasket. During which Ray added insult to injury by confessing to his wife that he'd been cheating on her with men. When neither of them kicked the bucket, Ray made a vow to never fool around with men again. But a leopard can't change his spots, and Ray decides to go out on the town. There, Ray meets up with an old friend, a drag queen named Jezebel, who drinks the new alcoholic beverage zombie schlager like a fish, even though she heard through the grapevine that drinking too much of it can change your insides. We were also introduced to Zarcaso Industry Technology, though it costs an arm and a leg to purchase. And to make a long story short, Ray gets picked up by the much younger mystery man, Benji. In the heat of the moment, Ray was faced with making a decision to either be true to his promise to his wife or cheat on her with the hot young guy from the bar. Is Benji a blessing in disguise, or has Ray bitten off more than he can chew? Your guess is as good as mine. And now, part two, with a little reminder that it is... Not for kids. Zombie Schlager by Belweth Harbright He saw it then, as if it were two open doors in front of him extending on into the universe. Two paths in either direction. On the one path, he could say, Sure, strange attractive man, let's go on an adventure. On the other path, he could say, Go away and go home to his wife. He would crawl back in bed, curl up next to her, and then sleep comfortably until the morning came. But he imagined smooth, supple skin under that suit, got a whiff of that musky smell of man, and his dick did the thinking for him. They walked through the streets of downtown New Haven at a casual stroll. I'd drive, but the wife would kill me for it. Benji blinked, and they continued onward. The new biobulbs the city council installed washed a hazy yellow speckled with black over most of the streets. Rusted-out cars and whirring automatons made the pools of darkness less frightening than they should have been. The New Haven Reclamation Project was working on cleaning up the mess and the hassle left over from everything, but it was slow going. So what happened with you? Ray asked. During the uprising, I mean. Benji stared off into the distance. Ray followed his gaze and they both winced. A security bot had snagged a crawler and was upending it into its threshing maw. A wash of gore painted the street before it. Ugh, Benji said after a minute. He turned his gaze on Ray. I was working on my anthropology doctorate at MU. We were in one of those little college towns upstate. My fraternity got a big dose of the bacterium and I was the only one uninfected. I was locked in my room at the edge of the hallway on the third floor. It was too high to jump through the window, so I had to fight my way through a big crowd of my frat brothers to even escape. Sounds terrible, Ray said. Nothing like slaughtering guys you used to drink with, Benji said. He sighed. But all that happened a long time ago. I managed to get here, meet up with my sister. Life's been pretty good since we came here. They both looked at the security drone, which was shoveling the loops of intestine it missed the first go-round back into its gullet. Ray turned to the younger man. You ever get nightmares? He asked. Benji smiled at him and nodded. All the time, the younger man said. All the time. So, what do you do for a living? I'm a curator, Benji said. Giving tours at the Museum of Recent American History is what I'm paid to do. Zarcaso Industries run that, don't they? Ray asked. Benji nodded. 
It really ought to be called the Museum of Recent Zarkashian History, Benji said. I say I'm a curator, but Zarkasso sends his assistant down to take pictures of it and tell us what to put where. The whole thing is a masturbatory hallelujah to himself made 3D. The two of them watched the security drone lumber away, a smear of rotten blood left on the pavement as the only reminder of the monstrosity that had clawed its way up to the surface. Do you want to see it? Benji asked, his voice teasing. I'll give you your very own private tour, if you know what I mean. Ray did. He again saw his future as if two doors had opened in front of him. Through one he saw his bedroom, his wife, his house, and his reassuring reality. The other, a blank slate. Unknown unknowableness, a void of gray space, creative matter. A midnight museum tour, Ray said. He smelled man in his nose, could feel it on his skin. He shrugged. Hell, why not? I'm up for anything. Benji grinned. I'll bet you are, he said, eyes hungry. The five-block walk was impressively short and devoid of issues. The latest model drones stalking the sidewalks kept the streets relatively clean at night. When they got to the corner where the museum was, most of the streets and structures of downtown changed radically. There, surrounded on all sides by dying grass and illuminated by bio-search lights, the white, pillared monstrosity was standing tall and mighty, taking up nearly half a street by itself. Benji hopped the steps to the front door two at a time, his keys on his chain jangling. At least I get some benefit out of running this joint, he said over his shoulder. The door creaked and he slipped into the open, waiting darkness. Ray stood at the bottom of the steps and looked up at the cracked door. A twinge of guilt pinched him right in the heart and he teetered on the edge of making a decision. To go in or to go home. He looked all around him trying to postpone going inside. On one corner of the street, a big white van was double parked next to a knocked-over hydrant. A silver-colored automaton whirred to itself as it stalked down the road. The moon hung high overhead in the shape of a crescent. It held no answers for him. You coming? Benji asked him from the doorway. Ray jumped and turned, smiling. Of course, he said. The lobby of the museum was upholstered in reds and blacks of nearly every color and variation. It was a little like falling into Count Dracula's wardrobe. Thick crimson carpet led up to a gigantic skull embedded in the wall. The carpet was its tongue, apparently. On either side of it, the floor was black-stained marble. This has to be the cleanest place I've seen in some time, Ray muttered. We have a hunk of junk that does that in his spare time, Benji said. He held his hands up to the corners of his mouth and hollowed into the depths. Oi, Zanzibar! There was a clanking of metal as an automaton tottered up from a side room. It resembled nothing more than a barrel with an upside-down bucket for a head. Its eyes looked like headlights from the old days. Salutations, Master Benji, it buzzed. I see you have yet another visitor. Shall I change the bedsheets? Again? Ray never thought it would be possible to hear an automaton sneer, yet here he was. Benji at least had the grace to blush. Don't be stupid, Zanzibar. He shot dagger eyes at the robot. Mr. Thomas here just complimented the job you've done on janitorial work. The automaton's eyes looked Ray up and down. I'm sure he did. Lord knows you can't clean up after yourself. Benji sighed and slapped a hand over his forehead. I apologize for the rudeness of my co-worker here. Charlotte, my sister, she scavenged his AI chip from the reject pile over by the Zarcaso Tower. Can't imagine why they threw him out. They dislike the idea of independent thought, Zanzibar buzzed. Nobody likes a robot that tells it how it is. How is it? Ray asked. Zanzibar's headlight eyes focused on him and opened slightly wider. Mr. Benji goes through more lube than the robot factory. It buzzed. Go away and make yourself useful. Benji snarled. Master Benji likes his men like he likes his cheese. Aged and past their prime. Benji pushed him back to the side door. Its metal arms reached out and pressed against the side of the door to hold its place. Master Benji likes his men like he likes his beer, with a full body and lots of head. Benji kicked the robot back into the room and slammed the door, locking it. His pale skin was flushed crimson, his eyes were wide, and his hair was plastered to his skin with sweat. He looked more human, more approachable. Roommates, he said, exasperated. Ray laughed. The sound echoed against the tiles around them. They decided to take the tour after having a few drinks in the break room. Benji mixed a white vodka chaser he called a plasma punch and opened himself a bottle of Schlager. The tour is going to be a little informal, 
gets so boring saying the same shit over and over again, Benji said. Ray nodded. It's been ages since I've been in the museum, he said. Me and my wife haven't done much but go to the grocery store and clean up the house since they took back the city. He turned to look at Benji, whose face was hidden by the bottle of Z. The younger man tilted it back and knocked it off, then grabbed another one from the shelf and met Ray's gaze for half a second. Benji's eyes seemed to be slightly harder, inscrutable in emotion. He twisted the cap off another bottle and knocked it back in the same ravenous tilt. He slammed the bottle on the counter beside him, and with that, the grinning, handsome man was back again. Let's tore it up, he said. Ray nodded and followed him back to the main room. He turned to look at Benji, whose face was hidden by the bottle of Z. The younger man tilted it back and knocked it off, then grabbed another one from the shelf and met Ray's gaze for half a second. Benji's eyes seemed to be slightly harder, inscrutable in emotion. He twisted the cap off another bottle and knocked it back in the same ravenous tilt. Benji was walking backwards up the steps, arms wide. They were going up the red-carpeted tongue of the huge skull into the first of many exhibits. Our first stop on the tour, Benji said theatrically. They passed through the mouth of the skull. Ray felt hot wind blow itself past his face as if he were walking into the mouth of some huge monster ready to be devoured. They'd walked into a small room. Fake blood spattered the polished wood parquet. Dizzying lights kaleidoscopically bounced in cycles from dark to light to shades of crimson. Each wall was covered by multiple flat-screen televisions, all running different newsreels. Hordes of bloody, deranged people milling and stumbling around. Frantic newscasters' faces. Preachers screaming. People jumping from skyscrapers. Against the far wall, there was a twisted wax diorama of a nuclear family. Mother, father, son, and daughter all running. A hand erupting from the earth had clutched the youngest by the leg. In the middle of the room, a bronze statue of a group of gruesome-looking corpses fought each other for the fresh remains of their latest target. The victor held his prize aloft, a half-chewed dog leg torn at the hip. There was a malicious grin on his half-jaw. We begin at the beginning. Awful, isn't it? But our wonderful city of New Haven and the beginning of megacorporations Arcaso Industries would not be possible without an explanation of what had gone before. Here we see the beginnings of the uprising, when the dead pulled themselves from the ground and shambled forth to greet and eat the living. Ray stepped closer to one of the screens and looked. It was an old newsreel of a dead body ripped into pieces recently. Before his eyes, it began to shake and move, each finger flexing itself maniacally, each muscle quivering as if plugged into an electrical outlet. He closed his eyes and turned away. He felt Benji's hand on his shoulder, warm and grasping. They say we should never forget, the younger man said, his voice soft. But how can we? They got my son, Ray said after a few moments. Hot tears were slipping from his closed eyelids. Those Undead bastards got to him when he was on the phone with me. I got to hear him screaming as they bit into him and tore him into pieces. Benji grabbed him close and hugged him. Ray could almost forget where he was. We survived, Benji whispered in his ear. We'll never forget. Our stories will live on beyond us, and when the world is finally clean again, when the streets are safe and life gets back to normal, we'll make monuments to those who have passed. Ray nodded and Benji gave him a few minutes. They moved onwards when Ray's tears had dried. The red lights behind them flicked off automatically when they left. The next room was covered wall to wall with machines, as if they had stepped into a military strategy room. And indeed, this was the intended effect. A gigantic table spread out in the middle on a raised wooden dais. Wax figures were seated here as well, almost lifelike caricatures of the president at the time and his top brass. Ray poked the prior president in the eyeball with a forefinger. Our leaders were stumped, Benji said. Where had they come from? No one knew. Nobody had any answers. Conspiracies abounded. The news stations were on 24-7. It was panic, panic and chaos. Preachers on the radio were screaming that it was the rapture. The rest of the world had put up an embargo against us, the entire continental U.S. locked away, tighter than Alcatraz. Foreign ships patrolled the coast and killed anyone who tried to escape. Canada wiped out any border cities as a preventative measure against the infection. Mexico enforced their side of the border with the help of the drug cartels. Times were bad. Didn't realize this would be such a buzzkill, Ray muttered. I thought it would be kind of like when you go and see a horror movie on a date, Benji said, shrugging. There was a mischievous look on his face. 
Only this is more educational, I guess. It usually impresses guys when they see how cultured I am. Ray wanted to tell him to just skip the damn tour, but he kept his trap shut. Maybe he was trying to put off the inevitable, to not face the fact that he was going to cheat on his wife at the end of this tour. He wasn't sure. They moved on to the next room. It looked like a lab. EKG machines against one wall, and wax figures of men in lab coats decked the area. In the middle of this room, there was a wax corpse, obviously still struggling against its bonds, strapped to a table. Men on either side of it had scalpels at the ready. A breakthrough occurred. A group of researchers, headed by the son of a wealthy oil conglomerate, captured and studied the Risen. Each day, they risked their lives. Thankfully, their efforts were rewarded after a brief two months. They discovered what had made the dead walk. Bacterium Alpha, wasn't it? Ray asked. Benji nodded. And thus the rise of Zarcaso Industries, he muttered. Tell me what you know about Bacterium Alpha and the cure. He looked at Ray with the same hard eyes from earlier. It's some kind of bacterial infection. I ain't really the science type, but they said what it was on the radio and the emergency broadcasts. There was a bacterial infection that caused the candida in the bloodstream to overpower the body. Benji nodded. It was a complicated problem, he said. We have two steps of infection. Step one, where the bacteria invades the bloodstream. Step two, the yeast in your body, the living fungal symbiote, the Candida albicans, which is responsible for devouring sugars, gets obliterated and replaced by its functionally similar cousin. Only this yeast keeps sending off chemicals to control the body. It creeps up through your system and sinks tenderhooks into everything. You're still you, but all you can think about is eating. America ate itself to death, Ray said, and he laughed in a morbid way. Benji cracked a slight grin. Don't get me off topic. We found a cure for the infected, he continued. Bacterium beta. It basically preys on the infected Candida albicans aberration and allows the system to cleanse itself of any early signs of fungal overgrowth. But if you leave it too late and the overgrowth is bad, then what happens is the Bacterium beta gets knocked out of the system. Works more as a preventative than anything, then, Ray said. Sounds about right. So we get stuck at a crossroads. We stopped the infection, but we weren't able to stop the majority of the undead and disinfect them, so to speak, Benji said. Ray nodded carefully. Benji put a hand on his chin and thought about what to say next. Thankfully, Emilio Zarcaso and his group of researchers found a use for them. Let's go to the next room. The next room was another laboratory diorama. Great metal vats stood on every corner of the room, with men in lab uniforms holding gigantic wooden sticks. Disposal. What to do with the countless teeming masses of hungry monsters? It was a great question that stumped everyone. Burning was no good. Bodies won't cook to ash without some kind of fuel, and the blockades in the country were still in effect. No trade, in or out. With a reliance on foreign fuels, we barely had enough gasoline to transport food from what remained of the heartlands. But Zarcaso had an idea. What if the proteins and the good nutrients could be absorbed from the corpses that walked? It would help with nutrition for those without enough food. He worked on a plan to culture another kind of bacterium. The only thing that worked close enough was a cousin of algae. If they chopped and boiled the corpses down to nothing and allowed that algae to grow on the remnants, they could filter the nutrients from it, make a drink from it. A miracle of science. A way for us to not only dispose of the corpses, but use what they had taken from us. I've seen that movie before, Ray said, suddenly feeling his age. Everyone has, Benji said dismissively. But here we are, a nation of the undead, and we've managed to reconstitute the basic vitamins and minerals needed for life into everyone's favorite booze. Schlager. A.K.A. zombie schlager. It's like Vegemite, only with dead people. That's why I won't drink the stuff, Ray said. I know it's scientific and all, but I can't wrap my mind around it. It's an acquired taste, Benji said. His voice was soft and neutral. It's a lot like public drinking water, I expect, Ray said. We shit in it and filter it right back to the water processing plant again, and then we drink it. Oh, that's, that's just gross, says the one who drinks zombie juice. Benji shook his head. Let's move on, he said, grinning. This room was more like a mall than anything. Vast display items were on pedestals all across the room in squeaky clean glass cases. 
Everything from vacuums to stoves to televisions and radios. And here we have Zarkaso's latest foray into revolutionizing the post-uprising world. Power, what we needed and what we lacked. We lived in a society two steps away from tribalism. Electricity was a commodity in short supply. Raw materials were even scarcer. Sure, there weren't as many people to use what we had, but in the same breath we had even less workers to help extract what we had. It was by complete accident that Sarcasso himself found that a puddle of fluid from a zombie could funnel and filter electricity. The bacterium, it came to pass, were symbiotically mutating the mitochondria in human fluid. They could store vast amounts of electricity and release them. He discovered that by further mutating the bacterium alpha, he could get mitochondrial remnant that actually produced electricity. Hence the rise of bacteriotechnology. Responsible for lamps and major appliances, flashlights, batteries, you name it, Zarcaso and his team of research has created it. And some of the most exciting developments have occurred in the past six months. The z drones, prototype anti-risen androids, have been released to the public. Fully programmable with different AI profiles and running entirely off remnant from the zombie schlager mixing vats, they are a self-sufficient answer for protection in these dire times. Ray looked at him. You sound like you're pitching a product, he said. Force a habit, Benji said. I have the speech memorized. But you see everything around you, don't you? Zombies power our electronics, serve as fuel for our robots, and make us healthy and, the most important part, drunk. We have nothing left but our dead, and we're eating their corpses. No wonder they call you ghouls, Ray said. Is that what they're calling it? Benji asked. It didn't seem like a question. Ray shrugged. That's what Jezebel said, my friend at the bar. She seemed lovely, Benji said. He paused. Would you like to see my room? One of the perks of being the curator is I get my own office. Of course, that basically means free rent. Again, that moment of indecision. His wife or his life? He chose. I would very much like that. Benji's room was at the way back of the museum, past the storage facility. They had to step over piles of curios and wax figures to get to it. When Benji opened the door, Ray got a waft of the room. It smelled like honeysuckle and harsh mint, like antiseptic mouthwash. The bed looked extremely comfortable. Benji slammed him into the wall as soon as they entered the room. He seemed powerful, dangerous, masculine. Benji's mouth pressed into his. It was warm and wet and hot heat. His knee pressed between Ray's legs and rubbed him in all the right places. I've been waiting to get you out of these clothes all night, Benji growled. They moved to the bed. Ray fell on his back and Benji moved over him like a serpent through grass, touching him here, there, and everywhere. It felt like he was getting pleasured by an angel. He grabbed Benji's head and twined his fingers in his hair. And when Benji straddled him, Ray bucked like a wild stallion like he hadn't in so many years. When it was over, Benji lit their cigarettes and the two of them lounged against each other's naked bodies. Ray swam his hand over the younger man's naked flesh, his old tanned hand against Benji's pale skin. He felt like everything in the world was peaceful, was normal. I could stay like this forever, Benji muttered, moving further onto his back. Forever. Ray thought again of his wife. He thought of her laying at home, all alone in that dark, empty house filled with echoes of a lifetime of marriage. He'd said that word to her once. He looked at his wedding ring, shiny gold against his finger, tarnished with age. I shouldn't be here, he said abruptly. His voice sounded petulant, morose. He felt Benji slither away from him. The younger man tossed the covers back and sat up on the edge of the mattress, cigarette smoke wafting from his hidden face. What did you think this would be? Benji asked over his shoulder. His voice seemed to be blank, divested of the charm and emotion he'd displayed earlier. If you shouldn't be here, then why did you come? I found you very attractive, Ray said. Benji nodded and fell silent. He took another drag off his cigarette, his head tilted at an odd angle. Let me make you a drink before you go. I'm fine, Ray said. Guilt was hot in his chest, like white heat. Don't go out of your way. He lumbered to his feet and quickly searched for his clothes. He could smell musk and sex on his body. Again, he thought of his wife. He sighed to himself. What was done was done. His dick had done the thinking tonight. Benji was standing naked over at the far counter. He was spinning a glass around, looking at it, and pointedly not looking at Ray. After a moment or two of deep breathing, Ray admired the slim musculature of his back. 
he turned back around and patted on silken legs over to Ray. A toast before you leave, the younger man said. His green eyes looked hurt. To make our parting more bearable. Ray Thomas, you old fuck up, you hurt two people this evening, he thought. You can't turn it down if you insist, Ray said. It was another white vodka chaser. They clinked glasses together and Ray knocked his back in one go. Benji looked at him evenly and kissed him. Ray kissed him back, a passionate kiss, and then when they broke, the older man smiled forlornly. You were great this evening. Benji nodded and sat back on the bed, puffing on a cigarette with a wistful look on his face. Ray hitched up his pants, made sure everything was tucked in, and then started fastening his buttons. It was not until he bent down to tie his shoes that he started feeling dizzy. He scrabbled backwards at the covers. Shh, he heard Benji whisper. His hands were cool and soft on his shoulders. Lie back now. You'll be fine. Well, you're not dying, at least. Not yet. It was like there was a hot fire surging from his gut to his veins. Ray felt sweat beat up on his forehead. He could feel his brain getting dizzy, his thoughts getting fuzzy. His sense of balance and ability to move his limbs were completely gone. What did you do? He tried to say, but he couldn't talk either. His tongue was just a random slab of meat in his mouth. It's a roofie, Benji said. His eyes, ever that vivid green, seemed to burn with passion. I just had to calm you down for a minute. I liked you, Ray. I liked you a lot. You really disappointed me, though, at the end. Ray tried to say something, say anything, but the room was spinning around him. All he heard was his own mouth mumble and moan. Benji pulled out his cell phone and called someone. After a minute, he snapped it shut. The people from Zarcaso Industry should be here any minute now. I like you, so I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. A little secret that people outside the corporation don't know. You know the real secret to Schlager? It's not condensed from algae. It's putrefacted zombie. See, after the mutant Candida sets in, the flesh starts to weaken and deteriorate. They have a big conveyor belt run by ghouls at the plant. They send the infected down the line and they debone them like chickens. The meat slides right off the bone. The yeast in the flesh makes the perfect kind of hops, so they shred it up in big shredders and water it down a little. Age it in wooden casks. You know how it goes. Ray stared at him. The room was dancing now. You're probably wondering where you come in, Benji said. Where you're at in the whole grand scheme of things. See, they're running out of fresh undead. So they're in a quandary. Where on earth do they find fresh corpses not touched with Schlager? Uninfected ones, you know. It's a little too dangerous to go into the big cities, so they have a department, ingredient transportation. They round up prospective new ingredients. The unleavened, they call them. You know, lacking yeast. Then they infect them. They let the yeast take over their body. They let it eat you up, make your proteins weak from the inside. And then they age you and move you to the vats. Ray summoned all of his strength and fury to reach out and hit Benji. But the younger man grabbed his arm and held it like he would an infant's. You should have stayed home with your wife if you loved her so much. His voice was venom. Men came into the room then. There was a blur of motion and noise, and Ray felt weightless. His head fell backwards, lolling. He saw Benji's handsome face, neutral as he exhaled a long plume of cigarette smoke. His naked body shone under the biobulb lights, his flaccid cock plastered against his leg. It was the last thing Ray saw before blackness swallowed him. When he woke, he was strapped into a gurney. He had an IV in each wrist. There were moans and screams all around him. His head pounded and his stomach growled. All he could remember were flashes of terror and anger. Drinking, zombies, green liquid sliding through glass. A naked man smoking a cigarette. The room he was in was cavernous, enormous, extending onwards and away in every direction. There were other gurneys all around him for as far as his eye could see. Everyone was strapped up, strapped in, and unable to move. His nearest neighbor was an ancient, wizened-looking man with a half-rotted face. Never escape, the creature lisped. His tongue squirmed through the hole in his cheek. His hands were little more than mummified skin wrapped around bone. Never escape. Ray had a sinister thought slither its way into his brain. It was his mother's voice again from so many years gone by. Mark my words, young Raymond. She said, he screamed to God, but only the dead heard him. 
Well, I bet some of you listeners smelled a rat and thought Ray would get saved by the bell, but I guess Ray got a little taste of his own medicine in the end. Side note, a few of those new suburb citizens that came down after Halloween got together and started selling off the trinkets they brought with them at a shipyard sale. I got invited by one of the girls that was in my orientation group, and you guys, this book of idioms I picked up is amazing. The girl's kind of amazing, too, but I kind of hope she's not listening. Anyway, I'm hoping the book helps me communicate a bit better with the new imports. And I'm thinking of starting to leak some of my transmissions to the upper adversity so they know we exist. A little housekeeping, citizens. All ships are ship-shape. All trains are on track. The steamers are adding fuel to their fires. The buses are ready to go the extra mile. The bikers are high on their hogs. The rickshaw drivers are off on the right foot. The sailors have learned the ropes. And all crews are in the same boat. Just kidding, they're on their own boats. Am I driving you up a wall yet? (laughs) Transportation jokes, I love them. In other words, all Subra City Station methods of travel are now back up and fully operational following the fall break, and pretty soon we'll be lowering our temperatures. So now's probably a good time to pull your fluffy scarves out of storage, and if you're a fur-covered being, grow out your winter coats. It's about to be prime time for snuggles. Until next time, citizens, I remain yours. Because I am. This episode's story, Zombie Schlager Part 2, was written by Belle with Harbright. While churning out horror, sci-fi, and fantasy fiction, and going to school full-time, Harbright also works as a freelance ghostwriter and creative fiction editor. For more information on his latest projects, you can check him out on Twitter at Bell Harbright, that's B-E-L-H-A-R-B-R-I-G-H-T, or on his author page on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Bell Harbright. The voice of Am Animus is Aaron B. Lillis. Other feature voices in this episode include Jose Perez, Matt Marr of the Dear Maddie Show podcast, and our intro was read by Welsh Wonder from Fiverr.com. To contact us or submit stories, please visit our website at subversitytransmit.com. This episode was written by Aaron B. Lillis. Subversity Transmit is a Crockett and Graven production. 